When you're holding on to all that you can't be Know that all there is to gain lies within arm's reach For the flaw lies in your head, not in your heart, see Welcome to One Church. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, and no matter what's been done to you, Jesus is for you. If this is your first time, a very special welcome to you. Would you take a second and head to our website, church.one, fill the Connect card out. This helps us know a little bit more about who you are and how we can be praying for you. Here at One Church, we continue to pray for one person to share God's love with every day. A great way to share God's love with someone right now is to invite them to watch service with you. Take a second and share the service link with somebody that God puts on your heart. Music is one of the ways that we worship our God, and right now we're gonna do that. We're gonna sing songs, we're gonna lift our voice, we're gonna open our hearts, and we're gonna give it all to the King. Numbered. 
you're sovereign Praise cause you reign Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave I praise cause you're faithful Praise cause you're true Praise cause there's nobody greater than you I praise cause you're sovereign Praise cause you reign Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave Praise cause you're faithful Praise cause you're true Praise cause there's nobody greater than you Praise the Lord, oh my soul like right now to take a next step with Jesus. You can head to our website, church.one. You can fill the connect card out. Somebody will connect back with you. You can make a decision to be baptized or join a group, but take a next step with Jesus today. We wanna to reach the most people in the shortest time and our YouTube channel is helping us to do that. Welcome to all of our new subscribers. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you subscribe. Turn that notifications bell on to stay caught up with everything we have going on here at One Church. What a gift it is to take what God has blessed us with and to entrust it back to Him. We wanna thank you so much for your continued generosity. If you'd like to give at any time during our service, here's how you can do that. We love to celebrate what God's doing here at One Church, and we do that each week with our high five. Check it out now. Up at number five, 24 worship services took place this Easter weekend. People encountered Jesus and we're celebrating 22 baptisms across all of our outposts. Whether you were with us online or in person, high five to worshiping our risen savior together. Up at number four, the Loudon Food Pantry often needs more spices than they receive by donation. So our Concord outpost collected spices over the last few weeks to donate to them. High five Concord. Here at number three, participants of Rooted just reached the halfway mark in their 10 week journey. Way to go, you guys. This time in his presence is sweet. High five to all those in Rooted this spring. Way to grow strong roots in God's love. In at number two, this past week, our young adults group met at our Manchester outpost for a worship night. It was a sweet time together and there's more to come. Young Adults meets every Tuesday evening. So if you're a young adult, ages 18 through 29, who's been looking for a place to have some fun, connect with others and grow in your faith, visit church.one slash groups and join in on the next one. And finally, up at number one, picture this, over 10,000 eggs and over a thousand kids hunting for them. This past Saturday, Rutland gathered for the great escape. There were five egg hunts, a DJ, food, face painting, and even a professional hula hooper. High five Rutland to more times like these. Thanks for joining us for our high five and I can't wait to celebrate with you in the next one. We live in such a divided world and our world today is oftentimes like trying to think about what we're against instead of what we are for. And so there's this interesting dynamic that we keep experiencing where it's kind of like, well, what are you gonna be against? What are you going to be for? And sometimes in the midst of all that, we can get really hung up on the things that we think we are against. And instead of doing that, I would like to focus on 
what we are for. You see, God is for you. That's the best thing of all about God, that God is not against you. In fact, God is pro you. God is so for you that he is madly, passionately head over heels in love with you. And yes, I do mean you. No matter who you are or what you've done or what's been done to you, God is for you and he loves you. And it gets even better. God loves you so much that he would send his son Jesus for you. That's right. Jesus came for you to lay down his life, to take all of our sin and imperfection inside of him, to put it to death on the cross. He did this for you and Jesus is for you. And so right now, maybe you're like kind of going, oh, is this is this God thing for me? Is this, is this Jesus thing for me? Is this church thing for me? Yes, yes, God is for you. Jesus is for you and his church is for you. We're beginning a brand new message series right now called This Is For Everyone. This is for everyone. As we look at some of the core practices and core beliefs of who we are at one, we want you to know that this is for you. This is for our world. This is for Everyone. We have an incredible memory verse. It's found in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. I'd love for you to read it out loud as we work on memorizing this together. It says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Oh, this is such good news. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is God's plan His grace, His salvation, His forgiveness, His love is for everyone. And that means you and everyone you know. That's why at One Church, we pray for one. It goes like this. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Would you pray that out loud with me? God, please give me one person to share your love with. God will allow you to share his love with your ones because he is for you and he is for everyone. Now, today we're going to take a look at forgiveness. Um, Forgiveness is such an incredible gift of God that that God would choose and make a choice to forgive us. But there are some common misconceptions out there about forgiveness. Um, There are three that I'd like to address right up top, three things that forgiveness is not. Number one, forgiveness is not reconciliation. And that's an important thing to point out. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. It takes two to reconcile, but only one to forgive. That's why we can make a choice to forgive others, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the relationship will be reconciled because it takes two to reconcile. The same, the same is certainly true in our relationship with God. God can choose to forgive us and he does, but to be reconciled to him, it takes two. We receive his forgiveness, we say yes to him and the relational dynamic that he invites us into, but forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. The second thing that forgiveness is not, forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not forgetting. There's this misconception out there that says you have to forgive and forget. Honestly, that's probably not even a good idea. There are things that have happened, things that we've experienced that we probably should remember. And it's not only um, okay to remember, it might actually be a really good idea to remember. But that doesn't mean that we can't forgive just because we do remember. In fact, forgiveness may be even more powerful when we do remember. We remember what was done. We remember how we felt. We remember the wounds from that action that that other person did. And yet we choose to forgive anyway. And so forgiveness is not forgetting. You can forgive, but you still might need to file a restraining order. And that's something to remember. Like you, have to, you can still put boundaries in place because you didn't forget. And you also don't wanna uh, uh, keep allowing a, a dynamic that uh, encourages another person to do things that cause damage and heartache and pain. We can forgive, um, but there's still some boundaries that can be there. Third thing that forgiveness is not, forgiveness is not, does not mean no consequences. It doesn't mean that there's no consequences for actions. Like like when we mess up and we do things that harm people and cause pain and heartache and destruction and chaos in this world, there are consequences. We can choose to forgive someone, uh, but the state of New Hampshire may not. Uh, There may be some consequences that, that come from those actions. And so... That's the normal course of life. And so uh, those are three things that forgiveness is not. Now, here's two things that forgiveness is. Forgiveness is personal. It's personal. It's between you and another person. 
There is a person involved here. And so a lot of times, like, like we, we've kind of gotten into a mindset that says that organization hurt me or that, that workplace hurt me, uh, that institution hurt me. No, people hurt people, people wrong people. And so when it's this kind of big overarching giant thing, um, it can be overwhelming to even think about forgiveness. But when we remember that, wait a minute, forgiveness is personal, just like God forgives me as a person. Now I have the opportunity to forgive others as people. It's a personal thing. Now in, in light of that, I would like to make a quick distinction um, between sin and being offended. And they're not the same thing. Someone can sin against you. That means that, uh, that they lie about you or they lie to you. They steal from you. Um, they actually cause some physical harm or do something to you. Uh, this, the, there are sins. And so if somebody sins against us, we have the opportunity to forgive them. An offense is different. Just because somebody does something that I might not like, it doesn't mean they sinned against me. And I certainly don't have to, to remain in that position of being offended. I think we can make a, a better choice and choose to overlook an offense. And say, so, you know what, I'm gonna overlook that. I've actually gotten into the habit personally is if I start to feel like somebody's trying to offend me, like they're actively like trying to hurt my feelings or, or, or say or do something that I don't like, I just ask them. I'm like, hey, are you trying to upset me right now? And, and if they are, they might go, yeah, you know, and I'm like, all right, well, I'm gonna choose to overlook that or maybe we shouldn't hang out right now. This may not be the best time. You just wanna do this later. Um, but a lot of times they're like, oh no, I'm sorry, that wasn't my intent at all. And, and there's just some, some really cool things that can happen there, but, but forgiveness is personal. We're forgiving a person just like God forgives us as people. And then forgiveness is for everyone. Let's go. It's for everyone. It's for me, it's for you, it's for everyone who's ever lived because Jesus is for everyone because everyone has sinned and we all need forgiveness. And without forgiveness, we're without hope and we're lost. Forgiveness is indeed for everyone. And when we forgive others, it's more about what God is doing in our heart than about the other person. Forgiveness is for you. It's more about what God is doing in your heart than even the person that you're forgiving. This is a gift that God gives us. It's not just that we have to forgive. It's so much better than that. We get to forgive. You see, God's commands are a blessing, not a burden. They're a gift. And we get to forgive. He forgives us. We get to forgive others. In the New Testament book of Matthew, um, it says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Okay, this is such a, a really cool uh, story in scripture. Peter and the other disciples have been hanging out with Jesus for a while now, and they've listened to him preach good news and seen his miracles. And, and Peter's like, man, this Jesus guy, he's up to something different. He's doing something new. This is actually better than it was before. So in that cultural dynamic of that time, they kind of had what we, we would call a three strikes and you're out policy. Uh, like if you, if you harm me uh, once, then shame on you. But if you harm me twice, then shame on me. If you do it three times, you're out for good. Like you, it's like you're dead to me, you, you no longer exist, never any hope of reconciliation or forgiveness. Now, that's really not that different from today. We, we take a similar approach oftentimes in our life today, but, but Peter thinks he's catching on to this whole Jesus thing and this, this good news thing and, and this forgiveness thing. And he says, so, hey, Jesus, you know, it's like, I can just kind of imagine Peter's like, I think I'm getting it. I'm, I, guys, watch this, I'm gonna check it out. Hey, Jesus, um, how many times am I supposed to forgive my brother or sister when they sin against me? Is it up to... Seven times? I mean, this got to feel pretty good. He's like, seven, I'm going seven, like, like the number of completion, like seven. That's like, that's like double three plus one. I'm going to double the norm and go plus one. That's, that's pretty good. And Jesus is like, oh, no, not seven times, but 77 times or 70 times seven. What, what Jesus here is saying is he's like, uh, yeah, so many times that you don't actually keep score. Like, it's not like, oh, 77 times means that, okay, I've got like a little tablet and, and I'm putting marks down on the tablet. Okay, hey, listen, you're at 76. You got one more and that's it. That's, that's not how this works. It's, it's Jesus saying, no, no, you don't, it means you don't have to keep score anymore. Oh, 
What an incredible thing. What a, what a game changer relationally for us if, if we don't have to keep score anymore. You know how we do this in our, in our power plays in our relationship? Like, like who's ahead, who's behind, who's got the upper hand? You know, who's been forgiven more than the other one? Who's got the power? Ooh, that's not Jesus. That's not Jesus at all. And that's what Jesus is telling Peter here. Yeah, no, no, no. It means you don't have to keep score anymore, Peter. Now, this answer that Jesus gives is really actually very rich. Um, the number that he uses there, 77 times or 70 times seven, it's actually a throwback to the Old Testament, uh, to Genesis chapter four, like one of the oldest stories in the Bible, one of the oldest stories in the history of the world, Genesis chapter four. It tells a story about how Cain murdered his brother Abel. So Cain and Abel were children of Adam and Eve. Cain murders his brother Abel because he was jealous of him. And then God like calls Cain to uh, account for his actions and what he did. And the, the consequence of that was that, that Cain would be removed from the community that he was in, the family dynamic that he was in, and he would be a restless wanderer on the earth. And, and Cain's like, this is too much. Like, this is not, a, this is not okay, because if I'm separated from my community, I'll be in danger and at risk, and others will harm me. And what God said to Cain was, you don't need to worry about that. If someone harms you, I'll take care of that. He says, if someone harms you, I will avenge you seven times over. And so what God is doing in that moment, very at the very beginning of the history of humankind, what God is doing there is he's saying, hey, humans are not equipped for vengeance. We're not wired for it. It's not who we are. But God can. You see, the problem with human vengeance is it always goes too far because we never know when to stop. But God can handle it because God is perfect. Now, just a few generations later, still in Genesis chapter four, the great, 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 I believe, grandson of Cain was this dude named Lamech. And Lamech gives this like speech. He's like basically saying, hey, this is how much like vengeance has progressed. He's like, if Cain is avenged seven times, if, if God's vengeance is seven times over, he says, then Lamech will be avenged 77 times or 70 times seven. Lamech's like, oh, you know, I'll be the symbol of ultimate vengeance in my world. Well, that's the way vengeance works. When humans take vengeance, it creates a cycle of vengeance where we do this and then somebody gets us back and then we get them back and then they get us back and, and it just keeps spiraling out of control and it happens so fast. And this was nothing new. So when Peter is asking Jesus about forgiveness, Jesus is throwing back and saying, hey, just like this dude Lamech is like the symbol of ultimate human vengeance, he says that Jesus will be the symbol of ultimate forgiveness. No, not, not seven times, Peter, but 77 times or 70 times seven. You don't have to keep score. And this is a beautiful gift. Like forgiveness is for everyone. We are forgiven by God like this. So now we have the opportunity to forgive others like that. And then Jesus is going to tell a story. And in this story that Jesus tells, what we understand is that forgiveness says, you don't owe me anything anymore. Forgiveness says you don't owe me anything anymore. Forgiveness is for everyone. And what it's saying to us is, oh, you don't owe me anything anymore. Your debt is paid. So Jesus tells them this story to illustrate that point. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. And he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Whoa, okay. Now what Jesus is doing here is he's telling a, like an absolutely like crazy, hilarious story. 
that his listeners in the first century would have completely understood. But it might help us to, to grab a little context as we compare the two debts here. You have the debt of one servant that he owes his master, and then the debt of another servant that he owes his fellow servant. So this first debt that Jesus is talking about, it actually represents a number that was probably bigger than any number any of them could have conceived of at that time. It's 10,000 bags of gold. It is a crazy, ridiculous number, 10,000 bags of gold. Now, one bag was equal to what was referred to in the times as one talent. One bag equaled one talent, and one talent at that time was used to represent the weight of an average person. So this is like at that time, like 130 pounds of gold for every like one bag. And there's 10,000 bags of gold. This is a lot of gold. And, and like the, the talent being the, the weight of a person, like this would be like that idea of uh, being worth your weight in gold. And so if we were to find the modern equivalent to this number, which are our numbers, you know, now we're getting used to dealing with bigger numbers, but they, they had no concept of, of billions. This would be about $13 billion a servant owed his master. An impossible debt, like a crazy debt, a ridiculous debt. Like, like nobody could even conceive of a way where a servant could have ever racked up $13 billion in debt. And if he were to have paid it off, it would take 200,000 years to pay this debt. That's why it's so crazy when this servant says to his master, be patient with me, be patient with me and I will pay it back. This is insane. It's impossible. 200,000 years worth of income to pay back the debt that he had racked up with his master. So the master knows that this is not possible, and he chooses to forgive the debt of his servant. He forgives him. But then we find the second debt, the debt that uh, a fellow servant owned the servant who had just been forgiven. Now this fellow servant, the, the debt is not insignificant, but it is very different. The fellow servant owed a hundred silver coins. And a hundred silver coins was the equivalent of a hundred denarii. And a denarii was a day's wage. So this is a hundred days of wages. And in that time, that would equate to about $15,000. All right, not an insignificant amount of money. If somebody owed me $15,000, I would probably like to have them pay it back. If someone owed you $15,000, you'd probably like to have them pay it back. It does, it does matter and it is fairly significant but it's not 13 billion. And so his, his response after he's been forgiven of this impossible debt is to look at the smaller debt that somebody owes him. And what he does is that, that same, that servant who owed him that smaller debt, he begs, be patient with me and I'll pay back everything. This is actually possible. But instead of being patient or instead of forgiving the debt, he has the man thrown into prison until the debt can be paid off. Whoa. Now, this is a problem. It's a problem. The other servants uh, saw what that servant did. They knew that this dude had just been forgiven $13 billion in debt, and now he's going out and choking a fellow servant who owes him $15,000 and is having him thrown into prison. And so everybody else is like, what in the world is happening here? This is a problem. And they, they go to the master and they're like, master, you, you've got a problem on your hands. One of your servants, the servant that you just forgave, this impossible debt is out there like choking another person and having them thrown into prison for this smaller debt. You see the issue here? This is a problem. And don't think for one second that there, there haven't been people who have called out to our master, Jesus, who've called out to our God and said, hey, you got a problem down here. Some of your servants that you have forgiven an impossible debt, uh, the consequences and wages of all their sin, everything they've ever done that's caused heartache and pain and damage in this world, some of them are, are refusing to forgive others. In fact, they're going even further in that. They're not being patient with them and they're punishing them and they're exacting vengeance on them. And these other servants, they call out to the father, you got a, you got a problem here. And it is a problem. It's a problem for me, it's a problem for you, it's, it's a problem for the world that we live in. Here is our, our God who is for everyone and forgiveness is for everyone and forgiveness is saying, you don't owe me anything anymore, it's canceling the debt. 
And yet we keep drifting right back into that vengeance mode. That's a problem. But God has an answer for that problem. You see, forgiveness is a gift. He gives it to us and we get to give it to others. Just as God has freely forgiven you an impossible debt, one that none of us could ever have repaid, now we have the opportunity to forgive others when they sin against us. Because here's the deal about forgiveness. Forgiveness is freedom. It's freedom. It is freedom. And, 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 and conversely, unforgiveness is, is prison. It's prison. When we, are, when we refuse to forgive other people, you know, we could think, oh, we're throwing them into prison. No, you're not. You're throwing yourself into prison, man. You're locking the door and throwing away the key. We're the ones who are in prison. When we forgive, it sets us free. We don't have to hold on to it anymore. We don't have to keep score anymore. Just like God has forgiven us, we get to forgive others. The next verse, verse 32, it says, Jesus says, then the master called that servant in, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Jesus is like, hey, yeah, this, this is a problem. And the question here is, is a big big question. Like, what universe do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a universe of grace and forgiveness or grudges and retribution? Do you want to live with the, the reality of the forgiveness of God that is so true and transformative to you that now you freely forgive others? It is a part of who you are because you have been forgiven so much. Forgiveness seeps out of you uncontrollably for others. This is the choice that we get to make. And it's a beautiful choice. I mean, remember, forgiveness isn't reconciliation and forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting and forgiveness doesn't mean that there aren't consequences. But forgiveness is personal. It's personal for you right now. Right now. God has forgiveness for you. No matter who you are or what you've done or what's been done to you, you can receive his forgiveness but it's also personal for those who maybe, maybe you've imprisoned yourself by refusing or denying forgiveness to another person. And you've been holding that. Today is a day where God can change all of that. When we remember what God did for us each time we have communion, that's what we're actually doing is celebrating the forgiveness of God, that he freely gave us his forgiveness and laid down his life for us. You can remember him and what he did for you right now just by saying yes to Jesus as your savior. Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Jesus gave his life for you. And right now you can say yes to him. Would you say yes out loud? Yes. And Jesus also took a cup. This is a cup of forgiveness. And he extends it and, and, and by his death and and burial and resurrection, they, there is a forgiveness that changes everything. It wipes away the debt. And now we're free to forgive others. When we say yes to Jesus, it's not just as Savior, but also as Lord, but not just any Lord, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We drink to the King. So right now, I'd like for you to take both of your hands, if you're willing. Take both of your hands. Take Take that one hand and make a zero with it. It's a zero. Hold it in front of you. Look at that. That's what God holds against you. Your debt is forgiven. And you can be reconciled to him right now. His forgiveness is available to you and you can be reconciled to him right now. Now take your other hand and make another zero. Look at that. This is what God holds against you. And now this is what you can hold against everyone else. Just as you've been forgiven, you can forgive others. Be still with him right now and just take a look at what he has done and allow him to reconcile you to him and then you to give his forgiveness to others. Great the chasm that leads.
between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living God. Who could imagine so? the promise your buried body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the
Hey, I'm so glad that you joined us today for our worship service. We're here every week and we'd love to have you join us again. So from all of us here at One Church, have a good one.